So welcome, my name is Veronica Reynolds. I'm the head of community relations at New City Library. If you're not familiar with New City Library, though I see most of the names are familiar, we're located in the lower Hudson Valley, just 45 minutes north of Manhattan. Not to be confused with the New York City Public Library, although we do get their phone calls sometimes. Um, I'm really pleased tonight to have this program. It was originally intended for April, if memory serves, maybe May. Um, it's one of our last to be rescheduled, unfortunately, but I'm so pleased we're finally able to have it. Um, one of our attendees was not able to make it tonight. He may be able to phone in at a later moment, but he lost power. But I'm going to introduce him in case he pops up. So George Ellison has written extensively about the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and Horace Kephart. He's the recipient of many awards, including the Wild South Roosevelt Ash Award for Outstanding Journalism and Conservation in 2012. And he was named one of the 100 most influential people in the history of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in 2016. I apologize for the phone, I can't silence it. <laughs> um, it's probably someone calling who's having trouble getting in, so I apologize. He and his wife, the artist Elizabeth Ellison, have lived in Bryson City, North Carolina since 1973 and both were honored as Blue Ridge Naturalists of the Year. Janet McHugh is a writer, researcher, and avid hiker. If you want to give a wave, Janet, so everyone can see it. There you go. Who lives in the Finger Lakes region of upstate New York. She and George Ellison have collaborated on several other Kephart publications, including the introduction to Camping and Woodcraft in 2011, and the biographical chapter in the Horace Kephart Reader in 2020. McHugh spent her first career at Cornell, where she specialized in library administration, and digital library development as a director of the Mann Library. Like Kephart, McHugh believes that librarianship offers a better field for mental gymnastics than any other profession, something with which I heartily agree. Ellison and McHugh were the recipients of the 2019 at Thomas Wolfe Memorial Literary Award for the Back of Beyond, a Horace Kephart biography, which is on our screen currently. Libby Kephart Hargrave, you wanna give a wave Libby so I can see you? Mm -hmm is the great granddaughter of Horace and Laura Kephart. She is a playwright, musician, composer, and filmmaker who wrote, produced, and directed the play, Horace Kephart, His Life, His Works, Him and His Words, and the documentary film, Horace Kephart, His Life and Legacy. Libby is passionate and dedicated to preserving the legacy of her great grandfather. She lives in Pensacola, Florida with her husband, John, and their very spoiled cat, Maxim. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll make a guest appearance. Always like to see somebody's cat. <laughs> And our local connection, Larry Luxemburg, has lived in New City since 1994 and has spoken at our library several times, most recently at a local authors forum in 2016. In 1980, he through hiked the Appalachian Trail and is the author of Walking the Appalachian Trail. He's a founder and president of the Appalachian Trail Museum in Gardners, Pennsylvania, and he is also a past president of the Cornell Club of Rockland who are co-sponsoring the event. And the format of tonight is fairly straightforward. Larry will be asking questions of our guests tonight. I will be here the whole time, although my microphone and video will be off, but I will be acting as projectionist. Um, so if you need me, you can go ahead and put anything in the chat. I'm also gonna put my email in the chat. You'll notice that as of right now, you are muted and your video is off, but we will have a question uh, and answer session at the end. If you're worried, you might forget your question. You can put it in the chat and I will read it for you at the end, but I'll also unmute people who have questions at the end. I think that's all the administrative work, but um, so I will turn it over to you, Larry. Um, thanks, Veronica. And um, for those uh, in the audience, you'll, you'll notice in the background of, of my picture, that's the Appalachian Trail Museum in Gardner's, Pennsylvania. And that the two white uh, paint blazes on the post uh, next to me are the Appalachian Trail in, in front of the museum. Um, the museum also operates the Appalachian Trail Hall of Fame. And in uh, 2016, we inducted Horace Kephart into the Hall of Fame. And in 2018, we in inducted his uh, colleague, uh, who was also instrumental in the founding of the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, George Massa. And in 2019, we followed that up with, with their, their other colleague, uh, Paul Fink, who also was instrumental in uh, uh, founding the, the Great Smokies. And uh, Libby, Janet, and uh, George were able to uh, attend those inductions. So um, that gave us uh, a good chance to get together. And I'll also mention uh, my, my own tie to the Horace Kephart uh, story. Um, 
not, I don't want to overstate the case, but um, I was interested enough in uh, Horace Kephart. In 1981, I took a bus from New York City to Bryson City, North Carolina, where uh, Kephart lived for many years and started out a 10-day backpacking trip in the Smokies by uh, uh, hiking to Bryson Place, his last permanent campground in, in the Smokies. So I've been uh, at least modestly interested in uh, Horace Kephart for a long time. Uh, we're going to begin our program today with um, readings from the, the prologue of, of the biography and, and we'll start with uh, Libby. And uh, Veronica, oh, good. I just imagine George Ellison's voice here, because he was supposed to be reading this, but he's in the dark. So, an unlikely candidate, an excerpt from the prologue. By the 1880s, the railway that would become known as the Murphy Branch extended from Asheville to Waynesville over the Balsam Mountains, via what is still the highest crossing in the eastern United States, to Silva and the adjacent village of Dillsboro. The Murphy Branch helped transform the region wherever it was extended. The North Carolina flank of the Great Smokies, in particular, became directly accessible for representatives of logging, mining, and land investment companies. In their wake came more homesteaders, missionaries, tourists, sportsmen, convalescents, and wayward travelers seeking a place of refuge. One day in early August 1904, an individual in his early 40s of below average height and medium build stepped off the westward, westbound train onto the platform of the depot at Dillsboro and looked around. Horace Kephart, having just left behind a wife and six children, as well as a botched career as a librarian, seemed an unlikely candidate for anything more than an obscure existence. But Kephart did not merely extract the information he needed from the region and then depart. He ended up staying, and in doing so, he became the writer most closely associated in the national consciousness with Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which he would help found. His camping, in Woodcraft is, his camping Woodcraft is established as one of the cornerstones of American outdoor writing, having been almost continuously in print in various formats since 1906. The place of Our Southern Highlanders first published in 1913, with an expanded edition in 1922 as one of the classics of both Southern Appalachian and regional American literature is secure, even while aspects of his depiction of mountain culture are still debated. This biography attempts to piece together the varied incidents in Kephart's life that took place in Pennsylvania, Iowa, Massachusetts, New York, Italy, Germany, Austria, New Jersey, Connecticut, Missouri, Ohio, Washington, D.C., and the Great Smokies of North Carolina and Tennessee, while at the same time evoking recurrent themes as they emerged and evolved through the years. A biography is not only the story. Is that you, Janet? That's me, Lynn. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Janet. <laughs> Sorry. So a biography is not only the story of its subject, but also of the major figures in his or her life. Kephart's father, Isaiah, for example, was a pervasive influence, especially in regard to their shared and somewhat idealized admiration for all things associated with the pioneer lifestyle. Despite some differences, the two remained close until Isaiah's death in 1908. Kephart and his wife, Laura, maintained a sometimes enigmatic yet constant relationship. Even though an attempted reconciliation in 1909 failed and they were essentially estranged for the last three decades of their marriage, they corresponded regularly and both attended a family reunion that took place in New York City in 1927. Bob Barnett, who appears as himself in Our Southern Highlanders and Camping in Woodcraft, and as the fictional character Tom Buford in Smoky Mountain Magic, met Kephart soon after his arrival in the Smokies. The two maintained a close relationship until Kephart's death in 1931. The Asheville-based photographer George Massa and Kephart merged their respective talents in support of the movement that culminated in the founding of the National Park in the Smokies in 1934. Most people who are aware of the Kephart story think of it as having two distinct periods 
life prior to 1904, and life thereafter. It's a dividing line that Kephart himself also fostered. But influencing his life both before and after that division are several important traits, themes, and concerns. Throughout his life, Kephart believed in the recuperative powers inherent in the natural world. And as a young man, he began formulating his concepts involving the need to search for and find a place of refuge, or as he phrased it, a back of beyond. Those excerpts are taken from the prologue, um, and they're, you know, I think a kind of mini biography of who Horace Kephart is. Um, but I think Larry's going to make us drill down a little deeper <laughs> and tell you more about Kephart than you've ever thought you'd know. Um, uh, uh, sh sure, Janet, um, and and thanks both to to you and uh, and to Libby for those readings. So, uh, first of all, um, uh, Janet, what got you interested in Kephart and kept you fascinated with his life uh, sufficiently to to do a four hundred page biography? <laughs> well, it, it stretches back a long way. This you haven't met George yet, but this is a picture of George um, from the seventies. And he had actually written a, uh, a wonderful introduction to our Southern Highlanders, which is Kephart's, um, probably his most famous book. Um, he had written an introduction to that book. Um, and I actually read that introduction when I was um, at grad in graduate school at the University of Michigan. I'd become interested in Kephart um, mainly from the Smokies. I my husband and I, that's a picture of my husband and me many years ago. Um, we had done a lot of backpacking and um, in the Smokies in those um, when we were in graduate school and when we lived in um, in Boston and to me it was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen and it was through the Smokies that I um, that I met Horace Kephart I met him through uh, a wilderness that he helped uh, preserve um, as a national park. So I became interested in him. I did a research paper when I was in grad school. I came as I was offered a job at Cornell. Um, that was my first job. And I, before children, I used to go to the archives on Saturday morning and look at Kephart's papers that were in the university archives at, at Cornell. Um, it got, Kephart got on the back burner for quite a few years. Um, but then I picked him up again and I first met George Ellison in 2009 um, when Libby had started a, a tradition of Kephart days um, where people who were interested in Kephart um, got together in Bryson, in Bryson City. And um, it was then that George realized I had done research on, on Kephart that was of interest to him and I certainly knew his work. Uh, and that's when we began collaborating. Um, it was really after Libby brought us together. She was our matchmaker. I like to think of um, Kephart Days as our first date, but um, that's sort of a long history of um, of me. But I should I should mention that since George isn't here, um, um, I, just had, I just saw a call in listener come in. Do you want me to unmute them and see if it's George? Oh, that would be great. It's that an would be wonderful. Number. Does that sound right? Pardon me. It's an eight two eight phone number. Does that sound number right? Is right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Trying to see if I can get, you know what? I don't know if we can unmute. I'm trying to ask. I'm hoping that we can get that to work. That'd be perfect. The timing would be excellent since. Uh... <laughs> it's listing him as muted, unfortunately. I'm clicking ask to unmute. I don't know if he's getting a message on his end. Huh. Unfortunately, hard to know. Because of the format, I can't promote him into panelists. Right. So I apologize, but he figures it out <laughs> on his end. I, yeah, and I unfortunately don't have much guidance to offer on that. Uh huh. Well, uh, as I, as I said, George became interested in Kephart um, also as a graduate student. He was um, he was at a a, a conference of um, of he he George had studied. Um, he was getting his PhD in, in literature, um, focusing on. Uh, travel writers and became interested in Kephart. Uh, it was then that he wrote the introduction to our Southern Highlanders and George lives in the Smokies. He's a wonderful naturalist and incredible writer. 
Um, so he's written many pieces about Kephart um, through, his, through his career and certainly knows the Smokies um, like the back of his hand. He lives surrounded by, on three sides, by the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Larry. <laughs> sure. So, so to follow up on that, Janet, and, and maybe George can jump in. Uh, you, you talked about how the collaboration got started, but, but how did you collaborate on this book? How did you, the two of you work together? And this is a question for you as well, George. Okay. Want me to take it? Yeah. Yes, that'd be great, George. Okay. Um, well, have you collaborate? Uh, I guess if you co-author something with a book, uh, you could write actually uh, together, uh, but that's that's not very feasible. Uh, let me get started on this. this I don't like getting um, Co-authoring the book uh, uh, was not exactly like us sitting down and writing each uh, chapter together. We devised a way, uh, Larry, of uh, handling material that I think would interest anyone working with co-author or a number of authors. Instead of sending all the material at one time to one person to handle it, it gets very confusing. So we've uh, worked out a system where I would make the first versions of chapters, pass them along to Janet who would do further stuff, and then pass it on to Francis, our editor. That kept the editor from being overwhelmed by too much material coming in at one time. We did, however, sit down one magical afternoon and write the prologue that you just heard. Uh, it, uh, it was something we, we didn't have to labor over. Uh, take a second, Janet. I'm getting warmed up here. <laughs> okay. Well, um, you know, I think um, I, I think one of the things we did were, you know, we we specialized in in various chapters. Um, George had a much more intimate knowledge of the Smokies than I did. Um, I had um, more more information and more knowledge about um, Kephart's early life, um, as well as some of his work on nomenclature and the Appalachian Trail, um, and the, actually the Smokies too. So there were chapters that we split up and said, I'll do X, Y, and Z. Um, and then chapters that we wrote very collaboratively in the sense that I might know the first half and George might know the second half better. Um, and Francis was wonderful in terms of mm, you know, merging our styles, although George and I got to to reflect each other's styles, I think, in the process of writing. George claims that, um, and I agree, that we have a hard time distinguishing who wrote what in in terms of our reading of the, uh, of the book. Um, and other readers have said that it's, they've appreciated that it doesn't read like two people wrote this book, that instead it feels like one voice. Francis had a great deal to do with that, but I also think um, I became a better writer by working with George. So, so an, another uh, angle here is that Francis is married to uh, a really talented woodcarver, uh, John Baudet, and he's become the symbol of the Appalachian Trail Hall of Fame because each person who gets inducted into the Hall of Fame gets gets one of John's uh, sticks, and he does very elaborate carving. Spends about six months getting the wood and curing it, and 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 doing all the work to to get really outstanding sticks. So uh, it's it's all in the family. Uh, George, a couple more questions for you. Um, Nearly a century ago, uh, Kephart found salvation living, living in a primitive cabin. And uh, today, you and your wife, Elizabeth, live in a similar way, uh, also with no electricity, uh, at the edge of the park. Um, did, did you emulate Kephart after studying him, or, or were you drawn to Kephart because of your lifestyle? Oh, let's see, Larry, which version of that would you, would you like? Uh, if, if possible, the truth, or, or let me say it another way, whichever is the better story. Okay. Uh, I was taking uh, 
a graduate level course at University of South Carolina that focused on the uh, an anecdotal hunting, fishing, uh, that sort of literature of the old South. And Kephart was the last uh, entry on the uh, reading list for that class. And I just sort of got infatuated with, with him. And when I got to Mississippi State University, uh, I was uh, teaching, and I taught uh, classes that we, I could work Kephart in on. And then uh, one day in 1972, I was at an MLA meeting, and we were convening uh, like you do at those sorts of meetings uh, in a room in a room at one night. And uh, somehow or another, the conversation got around to Kephart, and a young fellow sitting next to me said, uh, are you interested in Kephart? And I said, uh, yes, I, I do. And uh, he said, uh, well, I'm Steve Cox, the assistant director of the University of Tennessee Press. Would you like to write an introduction to how Southern Highlands, if we get permission from the family uh, and uh, the, the publisher? So uh, I was working on that, going back and forth from Starbuck down to the Smokies and Asheville, and just fell in love with their areas, as so many people do. And uh, about that time, my wife and I, who was dedicated to becoming a professional artist, and I was dedicated to become a, uh, a freelance writer, an independent writer. And uh, we could have gone anywhere at that point in t- time. We could have gone to Florida or California. But I said, hey, uh, why don't we try the Smoky Jersey? It looks uh, pretty nice. And she said, well, okay, let's do it that way. So we moved moved to uh, the Smokies and settled in. And the life, I think, reflected in Kephart to some extent, not as much as some people would, would think. Okay. Um, kind of curious, um, how how is uh, Kephart regarded today in, in Bryson City, and how has that changed over the years where, where you've been living in, in Bryson City? And has the book... Yeah book had any yeah. kind of effect on Bryson City? Okay. So, um, first of all, has it, has the book has it accepted um, in recent years with the, with, uh, with, with the appearance of, of the, the University of Tennessee press introduction and uh, the work that Libby has done with the Kephart days coming to Bryson City. Uh, I think the opinion of Kephart has gradually become more favorable. And now that these the new biographies are and they have the collection of of his uh, writings, people are beginning to see uh, the full context of his life. They thought he was oh, just some one, one who came here from up north and liked to drink and whatnot. But uh, they begin to see that the context of his life, they uh, created an exceptional body of work. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's becoming more accepted and favorable. So, so as, as kind of a follow-up to that, uh, for, for you, Janet, you know, um, Kephart is not my picture of a librarian. I don't picture librarians going on bear hunting expeditions. But uh, why, why is, is Kephart an enduring fascination for so many people? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I think Kephart's, uh, uh, the archivist at uh, Western Carolina University um, called Kephart an enigma. And I think that's really a perfect um, word <laughs> The, to describe Kephart. Um, you know, he, he's a man who in some ways had it all. He had a, um, you know, a, a promising profession. He had a beautiful wife and six kids. He had loving parents. There's a picture of their, his parents right here. Um, he was a wonderful writer. Um, and, and yet something happened, you know, that uh, made him abandon all that and move into a backwoods cabin in the Smokies. I mean, that's the, you know, that's sort of the, 
the two sentence summary of, of, of Kephart's life. And I think people, it's, it's, it, it is a mystery to try and figure out how a person, what motivates a person or what, um, what uh, drove a person to, to make those dramatic changes. And, um, you know, I think that in, in doing a biography, that was certainly one of the things that, that um, prompted George and my quest to understand the man um, more. Uh, but, you know, he, I, I think we have to be careful about stereotypes. I bet you there are some, some librarians out there who do bear hunting. I'm, I'm not, not one of them, but um, I do ground woodchuck, <laughs> woodchuck hunting. But, um, but, you know, I think there, there, you know, we have stereotypes of librarians, but I think they, um, there are quite, you know, quite a range of, of people and personalities in, in the profession. And I, I think just, I guess my last point is that Laura Kephart, um, uh, Kep, Horace Kephart's wife said that uh, Kephart was a, was a student first, last and always. And I, I think for people who like learning about lots of different things um, or people who are inquisitive about lots of different subjects. Librarianship is often is is a perfect career for them, and um, and so I think Kephart was you know he was a polymath and uh, a linguist and a historian and a you know a camper a bear hunter and um, uh, a woodcraft man. So you know I, I think he was a librarian for you know, all of his life. I, I, um, I'm going to read a little passage, even though you didn't ask me to, but I'm going to read this. Um, because I think it's, it's, it was a, it, it's a piece by um, a newspaper reporter who um, describes Kephart. And it says, um, you know, it says essentially anybody who comes to the Smokies looking for information can can stop at Kephart and find out the information he needs, but, or she needs. It may be a biologist in search of data about some unusual plant growing in the Smokies. Horace Kephart can tell him where to find it and will accompany him on a trip, taking care to see that he isn't bitten by rattlers or lost in the forest. It may be a herpetologist who wants to catch rattlers or to study them in their natural habitat. Well, very well, Horace Kephart will know just where to take him. It may be an ornithologist who wants to find a new species of bird or a geologist who wants to study formations that have no parallel elsewhere in Eastern America, or it may be just a plain writing man who wants to gather data for a magazine article. It matters not who it is, what his specialty is, how learned he is. It is Horace Kephart who takes the responsibility of getting the information for him. So if there are any librarians in the crowd tonight, I mean, I think that's what a librarian does. And this was written in, you know, 1929. So Kephart was still a librarian, even though he was living in the middle of the Smokies. So, so we, 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 we know he was very talented, um, you know, in, in, in lots of different areas. But um, what, what do you think is his enduring legacy? George, do you want to take that? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, it is, I think, that uh, the healing power in the natural world, the uh, ability to get away from it all and to, uh, and to refresh and renew, renew itself, even if it's only for just, just one day, uh, it will be something that uh, is, is really important. So, 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 okay, so we've established he's talented, um, you know, kind of his legacy. And what, what else um, do you think is, is so special about Kephart? Uh, maybe you could take that one, Janet. Yeah, I mean, I think, you, you know, I, I guess I could, you know, give you a handful of things that I think he's most, um, that he's best known for, um, you know, certainly his, uh, as George said, the sense of being able to um, take nature and 
allow it to help you heal. Um, that restorative power is important. But I think his advocacy for the Great Smoky Mountains, the fact that the, the Smokies exist today, that, that we have a national park there, I think um, that's certainly one of the, his key legacies. Um, you have the Appalachian Trail markers behind you. Uh, I think he played a, a key role in, in rooting the Appalachian Trail through um, or across the state line um, through, through the Smokies. Um, there were various, various routes being proposed and um, uh, Kephart along with um, George Massa helped uh, establish an incredibly gorgeous route through the Smokies. Um, you know, I think certainly his writing, as, as George pointed out earlier, uh, all of his books are still in print. Uh, you know, having a, writing a book in 1913 and having it be available and republished and republished and republished uh, over the years um, is, is, is quite extraordinary. Um, so I think his writings, the, his AT work, his um, Great Smoky Mountains advocacy, um, his, his, his sense of, of nature being um, a healing uh, experience, I think those are all, you know, wonderful, wonderful contributions. And I think that's, you know, that's certainly a a pretty impressive legacy to to leave with us. Um, I could name other things like nomenclature, but I'm not sure that um, <laughs> we want to go down that deep. What, 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 the reason why? what What did you say, George? Yeah, I was going to just add one more reason why so many people are attracted to Kepler and be part of this legacy. Through the years, people have come to my office and talk with the cup hard and I just sit there and uh, let them talk and sooner or later I know they'll get around to what they like to do and that was get away from it all and uh, get, find that cabin in the mountains or cabin up on the ridge line. It's uh, I guess an enduring goal and fantasy, sometimes fantasy for people if they could just start their life over again. I don't necessarily think you have to do to uh, leave six, six children and a wife to do that. But uh, it's part of the American dream to get away from it all. Yeah, George, that, that's definitely one of the you know great themes in American literature. It used to be to go to the frontier, but he found the, the frontier in, in the Smokies. If we look at the slide, the, the uh, picture on the left, the Cooper House was... His residence, uh, you know, he lived in cabins in the Smokies, but uh, his kind of in-town residence for most of the last few decades of his life was this Cooper House on Main Street in Bryson City, and to the right was his office uh, nearby also in Bryson City. Maybe now we could uh, turn to Libby for a little bit of the family perspective, and, and if you could start by talking about your, your place in the family tree and how is Kephart regarded in the family today? Well, I'll start with my place in the family tree. Um, my grandfather was the fifth child of Horace and Laura. So um, it was Horace, my grandfather, my dad, and then myself. So, so which, which one of the children? George. George is um, in the bottom, the, the right, there. right, that's George. That's my grandfather. So one of the two boys. Correct. He was the youngest of, of, the, of the boys, the fifth, fifth child out of six. Um, and to answer the question about how is he, um, was it, how is he regarded in the family? Yeah. It's, a big, it's a big family. Um, there's five generations that have come after him. So there's a whole lot of cat parts out there. So I can't really speak for all of them, but I can speak for myself, um, his granddaughter, Barbara, and quite a few kept hearts. And I think that he is regarded very highly. He, he is a man who through many struggles found his way um, through, he found his way back after a very difficult time. And he did, I would say he did the very best he could. You know, we all have a tipping point in life and we don't know what that tipping point is. Um, 
and his tipping point, we're not quite sure what, what exactly it was, but he found his way out of that. And I think for anybody in any family, that's something to be highly regarded and respected. And how has his legacy affected the succeeding generations of the family? You know, have, have any people, uh, you know, gone to a cabin, anybody become naturalist, uh, a- any other kind of influences on the succeeding generations of the family? Absolutely. There are quite a few writers. I will speak for my cousin, Beth Kephart, and um, her sister, my cousin, Janice Kephart, are both very, very good writers. Um, There's hikers, there's campers, there's um, artists. I think that we've kind of each taken a little bit from Horace and Laura, and, you know, they, they gave us a little bit of themselves, and we try to blossom with what they've given us. And for the Cornellians in the audience, uh, mm-hmm. uh, any lingering Cornell influence on the family? Yeah. Um, I always, th- I think that um, I always look at Cornell with great respect because and love the Mac family. That's Laura's family. They, he, her father worked at Cornell. They lived at Cornell. That's where this love story began. So Cornell holds a special place in my heart, and I know in, in the hearts of quite a few of, of my family members. Um, my grandfather donated a lot of Kephart material to the library at Cornell. I've donated a little bit of what I have. Um, so it's always, it's always there for us. And if we need to do some research, they've opened their doors to, to me and to other Kephart family members. Um, Cornell's very special. Um, and I will say, just walking on the campus, I think my IQ goes up a little bit higher. So that's a good thing. <laughs> So, so have any of the succeeding generations uh, attended Cornell or worked at Cornell? Um, not that I, I don't know if any have. Um, we do know, you do know that five of his six children went to Cornell. I don't know of any that have gone to Cornell um, from other generations. So, so um, re- reading the book, it, it struck me, you know, knowing the, the current price structure at Cornell, that the the family was uh, a little impoverished and uh, the the kids had to go to Cornell because it was free. And it, it's hard for current uh, Cornellians to, to think of Cornell as a place you had to go to because you were nearly destitute. Um, and, and Libby, also, what what's your personal views of him? Hmm. I admire him so much, and I think anybody who who knows me as well as Janet and George and Baj and George Frizzell, everybody that we've had this wonderful core group of people, and I would say most every member of my family knows I am passionate about preserving his legacy. He um, he he went to a very dark place. He found his way back. He and Laura never divorced, never separated. They stayed in touch. They did. They made the most out of the marriage that they possibly could. And um, I have great respect for that, for both of them. But what he did to, to save the Smokies, millions and millions of people have visited that. Wow, what a legacy. Yeah, yeah George uh, can correct me, but if, uh, if I'm correct, it's the most visited of the wilderness <laughs> parks. I mean, it, millions of people go to the, to the Smokies each year. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, mm-hmm. so. And I, I will say, um, Larry, that every time I, I go to Bryson City, um, on most trips, the very first stop I make is to his grave. And just sit there for a few, moment, for a few moments, and I thank him, and I thank Laura for her, what she sacrificed. And more often, I see people leave little gifts on his grave. And it's very interesting to see things that people leave, little rocks, leave fishing hooks and lures. And sometimes they leave money, little you know, coins, which we, I've told the cemetery people, just take the money and put it in a fund for something. But um, just to go and thank him. And it's, it's, it's very humbling. Yeah, I'm sure he's uh, affected tremendous numbers of people. And now if we could uh, turn back to the, to the authors, um, I was struck by uh, how accomplished he, he was in so many subjects. I mean, he was a librarian at the highest level. He was considered the, the expert on, on small firearms in the country, the, 
the the leading outdoor writer, the leading expert on camping and woodcraft, and and certainly the you know one of the experts on the Smokies and the regional people and so forth. Um, tremendous uh, amount of accomplishments. So so how did how did he become so accomplished in so many diverse areas? George, you want to take that? Yeah. Uh... Coleridge said that the reason he didn't get any poems written during the latter part of his life is that he had too great an interest to do too many things. And Kephart was that sort of person. Uh, he had a deep interest in many things, but he would just pick up some some hobby or some, some craft to follow. He would find something to write about, write about it. Uh, and... Um, Yeah, so 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 there, you know, you you see him there where he's he's shot a rattlesnake. He was he was a great hunter. He loved practicing his his shooting. Um, he was an inventor. He invented a bullet. I mean, just a tremendous uh, range of of accomplishments. Um, I the, think he worked hard though at those, Larry. You know, if you think about what, um, you know, he had lots of language skills and but he worked hard at developing those language skills whether it was Finnish you know by uh, working uh, with a community of Finns or whether it was Cherokees w working with learning Cherokee by working with a, a, a group of Cherokee natives um, you know and I he targeted I mean he was an expert shot he but he was at um, he did he did matches uh, continually when he was in, in um, he did t practice target shooting when he was at Yale, but also in St. Louis, um, you know, you can, you could look at his scores and, uh, in, in, in um, you know, American Rifleman and, you know, and find him as, as being a top, um, a top marksman. So I, I think, you know, he, uh, he, when he wanted to learn something, he dedicated an enormous amount of effort into into mastering that into mastering that skill or that talent, um, you know. I joke that I I think I sometimes have married um, a Kephart, uh, a, a Horace Kephart, because Bodge, my husband has, you know, he has Greek, Latin, Old Church, Slavonic, um, Gaelic, and now he's studying Spanish. But in the way he does it, I suspect it was a lot like how Kephart did it. You know, he practices and he practices and and, and studies it until he learns it. Um, and he's doing the same thing with lichen. So I may have um, I may have uh, married the man that I've studied, but we'll see. I just got a message from Libby that she just lost internet. So we may. <laughs> We, we we keep I I I don't know what you're going to do, Veronica. Pretty soon you you'll lose. You have George with, and working in the dark with no electricity, and now you have you've lost Libby because her internet, which she was having problems with, um, or the community down in Florida was having problems with earlier. So she hopefully she'll uh, be able to pop back in. It looks like the majority of the questions that were aimed at her were at least answered. So hopefully we'll. <laughs> Well, 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 good. But, uh, let, let's turn to another subject, and I guess this is kind of the elephant in the room. Uh, why was family uh, life so difficult for Capard? And a related question, uh, how did Laura go from the unattainable to being abandoned? <laughs> I'll start off on that, and maybe George can add some additional things. I, this is a photo of, of Laura when she um, was acting in a play, and this is a, uh, a photo of, of, of Horace when, you know, as, a, as a young man um, around the same time. And uh, with an excerpt of, um, of Kephart describing who he is. You know, I know no games, I tell no stories, I'm anything but a musician, can't joke, guess, dance, flirt, etc. And Laura was the opposite. She was a wonderful pianist. She acted in plays. She was outgoing, popular. Um, the Cornell Daily Sun, for any Cornellians who might be on the um, uh, on the call, she she uh, she was regularly um, 
uh, cited as being helpful to Cornell student groups. So, um, you know, they were opposites, but they certainly, um, they certainly were in love with each other. Kephart spent a year, well, he met her at Cornell. Um, he uh, spent a year in, in Europe and he couldn't wait to get back um, to the States and marry, um, and marry Laura. So her, his goal was to find a job um, and that would help him be able to support two people and raise a family. And when he got a job at Yale, uh, he and Laura married. What, you know, what happened to their relationship? On, you know, I think it's awfully difficult to try and, and parse. Um, I, uh, you know, I think we get clues from, from what might have happened from some of the kids. Uh, Lucy, Lucy um, Ferno, Lucy married um, one of the Ferno family, for those of, again, those Cornelians who might be familiar with Ferno Hall. Um, Lucy says that, you know, my father wasn't a normal man and couldn't take the stress of, um, you know, a family life. And when that stress happened, he would disappear for long periods of time and, 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 and drink. I mean, Kephart certainly had an alcohol problem, um, but she, she attributed his inability to stay with his family as um, uh, attrib she attributed to stress. Um, George, Libby's grandfather, um, also you know, corroborated that uh, as well. Um, but Laura and, I mean, Laura wrote some of the most beautiful statements about um, her husband. You know, she believed in him for, you know, for his entire life, uh, for her entire life. Um, I think one of the most striking things to me is that Laura, uh, Kephart died in 1931, and Laura didn't die for another 20 years, but she always wanted to be buried beside her husband. Um, they originally thought that Kephart's tomb would, or his, his remains would be um, reinterred in the Smokies. Um, that never happened. The Smokies didn't, um, you know, had a more restrictive policy and who could be buried in the Smokies. So he was buried in Bryson City and she wanted her ashes scattered or she wanted her ashes um, to be buried next to Kephart. When that didn't prove to be possible, uh, her kids put a tombstone in the Ithaca City Cemetery that has Horace's name and Laura's name. It was a very uh, wonderful symbolic gesture, I, I, you know, on their part to, to honor her wishes and, and also, um, you know, state the importance of their marriage to each other. You know, it was just something that um, uh, it is, it, it's looking at it from the outside, one can't quite understand it, but obviously it was, um, they loved each other and, you know, until the end. Janet, there's that picture that, you, that my grandfather took, uh, or somebody took of my grandfather with Laura up um, in New York, close, not long before she died, and she's holding out her hand, uh -huh. and she wanted him to caption the photo, the wedding ring I never took off. Wow. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen that picture. You'll have to show me that sometime, Libby. Nice to have you back. <laughs> oh, we, lo we love Cox Internet right now, so no one ever. <laughs> George, are you still there? Yeah, I am. <laughs> okay, uh, but a few more questions about Cornell. So, so first of all, um, has has the book got much attention in, in Ithaca and Cornell, and has it uh, changed anything about uh, Kephart's reputation at Cornell? And and also, Janet, um, living in Cornell, you know, and with Cornell and Ithaca playing so so big a role in in the lives of Horace and Laura and the family. Uh, has working at Cornell given you insights into their life? Well, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure that our book has changed um, people's perception of, of Kephart at Cornell. But I think Kephart had a good reputation at Cornell. All of his books are in the library. I mean, you could do a search of the catalog and, you know, come up with 50 entries um, under Kephart. So his books and various iterations of different editions of his books are there. 
um, you know, Kephart's archives are there. Um, you know, he's considered a, an important enough person to be in the archives um, because of his contributions um, that, that he's made or and or because of his contributions as a writer. Um, I noticed I, when you told me about this question, I looked in the catalog today and we have two copies of Back and Beyond and I think they've been regularly checked out. So I was happy to see that, to see that fact, Larry. Um, but it's, uh, you know, certainly uh, I can walk around campus um, and see all kinds of, uh, of reminders of, of Kephart. I think people, you know, people, um, when I say that to people in North Carolina, they're sort of surprised that Kephart's presence is, is felt by me here in upstate New York. But, you know, there's a, a, a bench in the Botanic Gardens um, that Leonard, Kephart's oldest son, um, uh, dedicated to his wife, Pauline. And every time I walk by that, I take a picture and 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 send it to to Libby. I have now now I have friends who take pictures when they walk by and send it to me. Um, you know, as I said, Fernal Hall was uh, you know was an important um, uh, you know is an important part of the Kephart story. In fact, um, the uh, there was a, a mysterious letter that I found in an archive in, in um, at Pack Memorial Library, and it was signed by somebody named Juan Ref. And I thought, and this was in the Kephart archives, and I thought, Juan Ref, I've never heard anyone named, of uh, anyone connected to the story of Kephart um, with the name Juan Ref. Um, and then I noticed that this person lived in Wencroy, New York, or Wencroy, and I thought, Wen Croy. And um, Wen Croy is New York spelled backwards, and Juan Ref is Ferno spelled backwards. And it was a wonderful letter that, lo that Lucy, Kephart's daughter, wrote in code to the attorneys after Kephart died, um, wanting to tell the story of her mother's life after Kephart left, um, after Kephart left the family. And it, to me, it unlocked the whole story of, of Laura and, um, and her, her life after, um, you know, coming back to Ithaca with four, with six children, um, you know, ranging in age from, I don't know, maybe eight to 14, um, was, you know, uh, an extraordinary, um, uh, story and that they all the kids I mean even, even five of them graduated from Cornell but the sixth one also took summer courses at Cornell and that they you know that they accomplished so many uh, things in their life is really extraordinary. Libby right now is working on a, um, a project uh, that focuses on Leonard's work at the USDA and his um, his his trip to Africa um, and uh, she can tell you more about that, but it's, you know, it, it, it really is an extraordinary story of, of accomplishments for all the kids. So, so Libby, um, maybe, maybe you could tell us about that uh, project. Um, my great uncle Leonard, he was the third child of Horace and Laura, the oldest son, is credited as the first American to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, I have donated, um, and his daughter, Barbara, um, she and I have donated all his journals to Western Carolina University Hunter Library Special Collections and his pith helmet and all the other items that he um, that, that were given to him in Africa. Um, all that's been donated to the museum. We're trying our best to create this, keep this family story going. I've donated a lot of my grandfather's things to Western Carolina to show the accomplishments in, of this family, of Horace and Laura and their kids. Um, but Leonard's story is, is really fascinating and the journals are so beautifully written. Leonard was just as talented of a, of a writer as his dad. I will say, however, let me see if I can find it. Um, here it is. We all know that Horace's writing is really small, but it's legible and easy to read. I don't know if you can see this. This is, it might be hard to see, this is Leonard. It's really small 
and really hard to read. So I got through, um, and the paper, I mean, hardly, these haven't really been touched since 1927. Um, so I'm typing out letters that he had not typed out when he got home. But it's, a, it's a great story. In the biography, uh, do you know which page, Janet, that photo was on where Leonard was leaving for Africa? Yeah, it's in the second, second section of, um, mm -hmm. of photos. And, and that was the last occasion when the whole family got together, when, mm -hmm. when Horace came up to New York and, and they all came, the rest of the family came to, right. to see, see Leonard off to Africa. I don't know if you can see that there, but that's the family um, saying bon voyage to, to Leonard. Orange, my grandpa make it and Cornelia did not make it. But um, this was, when I found this photo in the journals, my heart just stopped. It was just, it's such a, a beautiful photo. And when, you know, people get the, it's on page, right, it's on page 87, when they, they get the biography and they look at some of these photos. Libby, that's yeah. not the biography. Huh? That's not the biography. Oh, I have the wrong book. <gasps> I, well, speaking of which, so John you just handed me this book. <laughs> speaking of which, <laughs> John just handed me this. I'm not even looking. I just said a horse cut part. Um, <laughs> well, this is another really good book. This is by George George Rizal and May Claxton. That's another show. Oh, I'm so slightly embarrassed. But the photo is wonderful. Um, but actually, it's it's it, 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 <laughs> John's, about, John's about to hand me the correct book. <laughs> and he's about to do this, though. this is um, Larry. You, you ask about um, Kephart's legacy, and um, just this, you know, two months ago, the University of Tennessee Press um, published this, um, which is Horace Kephart's writings, and it's an extraordinary. If our book is long, this is seven hundred pages of um, Kephart's writings with introductions to di different sections you know, uh, a section on his fiction, a section on camping, a section on, on firearms, uh, one on the family, one on his biography. So um, that too, if for anyone who's interested in Kephart, it's a great, a, a wonderful compendium of his writings from everything from camping to fiction. And do you want to show the cover again? Because I just made you large again. Yeah. Okay, sorry. It's, it's called... These, these publications coming out. The biography and, and the book on his right. I'm going to uh, raise Kephart's statue up quite a bit in regard, regard to the uh, Apple American literature as a whole. There's a uh, few writers with this sort of, of attention. So, so George, also, I, I, I guess uh, you have quite a following for your regular columns, and, and you've done more than your part to, beside the biography to, to raise uh, Kephart's profile. For, for the audience, I would remind people that um, if they want to pose some questions, if they could put those in the, the chat feature, and we'll be on the, the, the lookout for those. Um, you know, um, a, a flip side of Kephart, you know, he had a difficult family life, but on the other hand, uh, he seemed to have a unique talent for forming very close friendships. Um, how, is, is, is that a correct perception? And, and if so, how is that? I, you know, in, in the quote you had earlier, um, showed he wasn't much for small talk but he was a very serious person. And how did that go together to form those very close friendships? Yeah, I, you know, personally, I think that, you know, friendships were important to Kephart. Um, you know, it, there's a quote that he says that, well, you actually have it up here on the screen. <laughs> it's a good thing to have friends, not too many of them, but about a half dozen real genuine old cronies. And I think Kephart at, at Cornell had, you know, friends like um, uh, Harry Koopman, who who told us a great deal about um, Kephart's early life. In the Smokies, Bob Barnett was, you know, an amazing friend, as was I.K. I. Stearns. Um, George Massa, um, who was a, uh, a wonderfully talented photographer, um, his photographs and Kephart's writings um, were just such a... a a, 
a contribution and such a um, invitation to to both see the Smokies and protect the Smokies. Um, so I think he had these very close relationships, um, as far as we know, mostly with men, um, although there were some friendships with women like Margaret Gooch and um, a few other uh, important people that or people that were important to him. But I think friendship was a very important important aspect of his life. And he was a great storyteller. He was, you know, you 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 get a sense from his friends um, what uh, what he gave in those friendships. George, you want to talk a little bit more about that? I don't mean to be um Yeah, this is uh, something I bring up every case uh, again. It's the importance of uh, Horst Kephart's father in his life, uh, Isaiah. Um, he uh, struggled with Horst to stick and thin. Uh, he didn't even think of going apart in St. Louis. He went and took his son back. And they went out to the graveyard to look at all the uh, ins- inscriptions. And uh, then... Um, Isaiah Hef Horace in particular is the place that he was trying to in the smokies. Um, I said somewhere in the in the biography that uh, in, in my opinion that uh, Horace uh, that Isaiah was a co conspirator in the finding of the back back of beyond. Uh, totally admirable person. So so you think when uh Horace uh, returned to the family home in in Ohio. That 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 his father helped to 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 direct him to the Smokies. Yes, um, they uh, looked at maps and any other source of information, finding the places that were really settled and populated, and uh, really Horace eventually into the Smokies. Wasn't intended to serve as his final destination, but it was the one he decided on. And he and uh, Isaiah and Horace just had this um, tremendous ma- admiration and interest in the old pioneers' ways, the way life was lived. Uh, so, so he was a great influence on Horace. So, so related question, you know, about that that trip to the Smokies. So, so you know, we we know that alcoholism played a, a part in his life, or at least alcoholic binges. But um, why 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 do you believe, you know, after all your research, why do you believe that that he was so tortured? Mm. I'm not sure. I, I let Janet take a shot at that one. Yeah, I, you know, I I don't think we actually know. Um, you know, I think it's, it, I don't know that a biographer can be an analyst, you know, or a psychoanalyst. Um, you know, I think we have ideas of why he was so stressed. I mean, you know, whether it was his, his, his job, um, you know, family and uh, uh, with a wife and six kids to support, um, whether there were, you know, whether it was depression, what um, self-medication that, you know, that he might have um, used to, to ease some of that pain. But I mean, I think um, what's startling to me is that, you know, these are the headlines on this slide for um, uh, when Kephart uh, had his, his breakdown in, in 1904. Um, he was a very private man, and I try and imagine how, how, uh, how that must have felt to see the front page headlines uh, talking about um, you know, your, your very uh, public breakdown. And, you know, we talk about an intrusive press today, but um, in one of these headlines, a, a reporter, or in one of the stories, a reporter had actually gone to Kephart's hospital room. I mean, Kephart had tried to, had 
and had left a suicide note with a bartender and then walked to the Eads Bridge to, to jump off that bridge, but was stopped by a police officer. And he, he wrote a um, suicide letter and left it at the bar. That's the note, the, the full text of the, of the suicide letter is, was in the paper. His, you know, his psychotic delusions um, as he's talking to this newspaper reporter, they were recorded and not recorded by a, by a voice recorder, but they were re reported by the uh, uh, newspaper man. Uh, all of those details were very public. Um, you know, what's startling though is that in a few months after he'd gone home to, to Dayton to be with his parents, he was well enough to come back and, and, um, uh, and camp for a few months in the, in the Smokies before moving into a, a, a cabin for the winter. So to me, it's amazing that um, a man could have go down so, so far and, and pull himself back up again and um, with, you know, with extraordinary willpower and, you know, love surrounding him um, with his parents. So it's amazing. So um, well, one, one of the things uh, after having spent so much time with Kephart and, and delved into so much material, um, what, what questions um, still most intrigue you? What, what are things that, that you most would have liked to know? I, I know you mentioned in the book that, that he and Laura mutually decided to, to burn their letters, so, so that's lost, but, but, but what other, what, what questions remain? George, do you want to? Okay. I think each of us spent maybe uh, 10,000 days researching and trying to find information about a fellow named uh, J.B. JB Anderson. And uh, he uh, spent time with uh, Kephart uh, in the Smokies uh, and was certainly a close friend. But we just couldn't find, uh, put our finger on him, that we were happy with the solution. Um, so I think, Janet, uh, what we know about him after years of research for J.B. Anderson is that he uh, uh, liked to play the ukulele. <laughs> yeah, it certainly would be nice to learn a little bit more about J.B. Anderson. You know, um, I, I sent George a little note today because I had noticed in um, a book at Cornell that um, Laura had given to a young woman who was in the class of 1910 at Cornell, and her name was Colby. Um, and one of the things that George and I have um, uh, done some work on is a doctor named Colby. And so when I saw this today, I thought, huh, I wonder if this Dorothy Colby from, 19, from the class of 1910 might be the daughter of the Colby that um, Kephart visited when he first came to the Smokies. Um, and, you know, you, you keep looking. I don't think you ever finish writing a biography. Um, I learned, George and I had, um, had uh, read that there was a movie called Stark Love, which was a silent film, and Kephart was a... Um, uh, an advisor to the uh, to the producer and director of that film, um, and he mentions that Kephart had two different colored eyes, and George and I didn't put that in the biography because we had no corroboration on that bit of information. But recently, I was doing some research on another project, and um, it was uh, a, a, a woman who remembered when she was little that she had met Kephart. And he had two different color eyes, and we thought, "Huh, voila, we have the answer." You know, we could, we did, we had some corroboration. So I think you keep learning things about about your subject, Larry. And he never stops fascinating you as you try and figure out more and more pieces of that puzzle. And Libby, I suspect, would say the same thing, right, Libby? Absolutely. There's always so. So, okay. so you have ammunition now for your second edition. <laughs> yeah. It'll be in our next life. 
So we, we have a question that came in from one of our Cornelians and uh, J Janet, if you can read it, I'll, I'll spare the audience reading the whole thing, but it basically talks about how did Laura support the family? Hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a wonderful passage in, in, um, in here. I wonder if I can come up with it. Well, but, no, um, while you're looking for that, the, the second question is, uh, the, his family apparently lived about 70 miles north of Gettysburg during the Civil War. Uh, was the war a factor in his mental health uh, growing up? Isaiah had been, uh, Isaiah rode with the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry and fought in 19 engagements. And that was something that Horace heard about all of his life as his father's involvement in the Civil War. So, so was that uh, an ongoing trauma for the father, and could that have been passed along to the son? No, I don't think so. Uh, One thing Isaiah, that... Um, uh, Go ahead, George. Uh, I don't think, they, think anything was a positive factor in Gifford life, uh, except good things from his father. Okay, so we'll we'll take that as a theory that was proposed and rejected. And uh, Janet, you were hunting for something. Yeah. Um, you know, there in the middle of this of the book, two, page two thirteen to two fourteen, we talk a little bit about this. You know, the litany of odd jobs that Laura tackled reveals both the challenges the family faced as well as Leonard's admiration for his mother's indomitable will. She cooked, served, tended invalids and babies, gave piano and dancing lessons, and with her own hands split up for fuel every board in the old mansion that was not nailed down. Eventually, through a friend of the family, mother obtained a position as a file clerk in a factory in town, and for the next seven years, she toiled at that thankless task six days a week, 10 hours a day, for the incredible pay of $35 a month. After, 40, after four years, she was raised to $40. The family lived on the cheapest nourishing food mother could find. This meant a pretty steady diet of baked beans, brown bread, potatoes, milk, eggs, and cheese. The only meat in our house that I can remember was a mixture of ground beef and veal mixed with bread and onion and formed into a big rounded loaf with which which big rounded loaf which we called a turtle. Mother used to joke that the millionaires in New York had turtle soup but we had turtle meat which was better. I, th I think the thing that intrigued me about that section was that before she took that series of odd jobs and the steady job in the factory, it, it said she'd never earned a dollar in her life and had no idea how to do right. that. But, right. but she right. was uh, resilient and a survivor. She took in borders. She made potato chips. I mean, there's another passage that um, one of the other kids uh, um, summarizes in, uh, in a letter. And uh, it, it actually was in Lucy's, Lucy's letter. And it's amazing how resourceful she was and how, um, how extraordinary that might have been. You, you know, people talk about her, her parents helping out, but her dad died soon after she moved back to, to Ithaca. Um, so there wasn't that much family support um, uh, coming from her parents either. Um, so it's, it's, she, she was amazingly resilient. She was very close to her sister, Julia. Mm -hmm. And occasionally when she needed help, Julia would help her. Right. Now, I would say that the, the children always took very good care of, of Laura when Laura was older. Um, she lived with several of the kids off and on, and they just made sure that they, she had the best possible care throughout her life. Did, did she stay in Ithaca or did the kids move and, and she moved with the kids? She moved with the kids. So, so where where did she end up living in those <laughs> older years? For a while, she was in um, oh, geez, Syracuse, uh, Saginaw, Michigan. Saginaw, Michigan. That's where the fire was, where she lost everything. She uh, she lived out on um, she lived between Ithaca and Trumansburg too, in the old county home. That's where the fire was there, um, and she, was, she, um, she also lived in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, mm -hmm. You know. She, she lived mostly in Ithaca until she was um, until she was older, but then you know so moved back 
between kids. Um, she bounced with mo mostly the girls. She never, she did not live at any long extended time with George or Leonard. Um, so it was mostly with the daughters. Okay, um, just a couple of last questions, and unless any come, buddy, um, any come in from the audience, but. Uh, uh, did you have any research triumphs? Uh, we talked earlier about the things you, you didn't, weren't able to learn, but did you have any research triumphs and, and what did you personally get, get out of the project, uh, both Janet and George? George? Well, one, uh, one really uh, nice thing that uh, happened upon was uh, the years 1908 until 1910 when the Isaiah died, was something of a blank tourism incognito uh, to us. And by chance, we ran across some material that pretty well established that during that period, 1908, 1910, uh, he was living on the Tennessee side of the park uh, in some of the railroad uh, dwellings that were being built on that side of the smokers. At that time, so it was, it was fun to fill that blank, blank hole in. So, so the so that period, I I, I noticed there were a, a lot of questions and uncertainties. So, so that is a, a good triumph that you were able to to solve some of that puzzle. Um, Janet, mm -hmm. uh, same question to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think. Um, there were so many, there were aspects of his career that we knew well, you know, I mean, you could read his, his, his writings, um, but, you know, we had no idea that he lived in Washington, D.C. for a time when he was um, researching. Uh, he, did a, he did a series, he edited a series of, of adventure books um, based on, on, um, on journals and, and uh Previous publications, but he he lived in New York. He lived in Washington D.C. And you know, neither of us had any sense that he uh, had. This is in the you know in the teens, and we had no sense that he was he was um, he was living in D.C. So you filled in different you know different parts of his of his life um, in surprising ways, um, and it 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 helped you gain um, a deeper appreciation of, of what his life was like instead of that, you know, bifurcated, he had a life in St. Louis and then he came down to the Smokies. Well, he, he came down to the Smokies, but he lived in different parts of the, uh, he lived in Tennessee for a while. He lived in, in Washington, D.C. for a while. Um, he was not quite removed from the world um, in the in the way that you might have, um, you might have guessed if, uh, if you only knew a bit a bit of his life, um, so there were I think lots of surprises there. I think for me personally, um, what I gained in doing this biography was you know a wonderful uh, group of friends. Um, I love that I met George and uh, on this particular slide, it's it's a picture of um, Elizabeth's artwork. She's an an amazing artist. Um, I love that I got to know George, that we worked well together, that um, I felt like his home was my home away from home. I love that I got to meet Libby and, you know, the extended Kephart family, that she, you know, Libby, you have no sense of how many times she went um, hunting in people's attics and, you um, she would not not go personally. She would ask for permission to go into people's attics. Most of the time. family members, yeah, <laughs> but her family members were wonderful about sharing. You know, going through old boxes of letters and finding and finding material that that helped us um, write the biography. It, it, you know, we couldn't have done we couldn't have done the family nearly as well without um, Libby being that sort of amateur ar uh, archivist for us. So friendships, that's what I gained from the project, Larry. Okay, so so another uh, question came in from one of our Cornelians. Uh, several years before Kephart died, a mountain was named after him. 
and the the national park was created did he lobby personally for the park did he go to washington dc did he know the park would be created before he died george you want to take that first? no you take it that's you you'll be um yes he did know that the park was going to be created before he died i mean it wasn't established until after he died but he knew um, in fact, there's a wonderful letter to his daughter-in-law, Pauline, that says, you know, we've won. Um, you know, early in the decade, in the 1920s, he thought, you know, he couldn't imagine that, that, the, that, they, that the park could be protected. But by the end of the decade, he knew that it had been. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, I think that's, um, has to have been an important uh, an important um, piece for him. It, in that previous slide, um, Veronica, there's a letter that uh, he wrote to his congressman, Congressman Weaver, um, who did invite mm -hmm. him to come to Congress and testify. Um, he did go. He did go to Washington a second time when he. Um, the first time was for, the, for research, but no, no, the one with mimosa, the one with the painting on it. Um, yep, this. His, his congressman asked him um, in late December to, or mid-December, to write, um, to tell him why the Smokies should be protected. This is in 1924. Um, and on Christmas Day, Kephart wrote this eight-page eloquent letter um, explaining why the Smokies were the most important area to protect. In the, in the 1920, in 1923-24, when they were trying to establish a park on the um, on you know in the east, various locales were re vying for um, for their favorite area to be protected, and Kephart in this eight-page letter was explaining why the Smokies were the most important um, area to protect, and you know I, I actually love this section of the of the letter um, that he wrote to Weaver, you know, for wild beauty and grandeur, I have seen nothing in Eastern America that equals the Smoky Divide and its outlooks. You know, he describes the flora, the fauna, the importance of um, the old growth forests. He, he tells why, um, you know, it's the, one of the reasons why it is one of the most popular parks is because it's, it's close to the centers of population on the East Coast. Um, so he explains all those um, details, and and uh, uh, the you know the letter was part of the congressional record. You can go, you can anybody who has access to the congressional record can go can go find it today. Did that answer that question, George, um, Larry? I had several. Yeah, I, I think the the basic uh, answer is yes. He he knew that the park would be established, and and he's given credit for being one of the most instrumental in getting the park established. But um, it reminded me that um, the 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 plaque for the establishment of the park is in Newfound Gap. You know, where the Appalachian Trail also cuts through. And, and as a through hiker, uh, it took me about three weeks to get from the, the southern uh, terminus of the Appalachian Trail to Newfound Gap. And I felt like a really grizzled veteran when I got to Newfound Gap. And then I see the, the plaque, I read the plaque, and then I see a sign 1,800 miles to Katahdin. And it just was an overwhelming feeling. I thought I'd been working really hard and had uh, gotten almost nowhere. Um, let me see, I think we have another good question coming in. Oh, um, yeah, the the question is uh, the, the story of how Charlie's Bunyan was named. Um, and and uh, yeah, just uh, will you tell the story of how Charlie's Bunyan was named? George, you want to take that? No, I'll let you take it. You go up to that. <laughs> well, it's, it, I think Charlie relates to Charlie Connor, and um, Charlie's feet probably look a lot like mine. But he was—he took his boots off one day, and um, after a rigorous hike, and um, and talked about how much his feet ached. And I mean, at least this is the this is the story. Um, I'd have to go back and read it a little bit more carefully to remember all the details, but um, 
Kephart quipped, you know, Charlie, I'm going to name, I'm going to name a mountain after, after your bunion. And um, so I, I didn't really talk too much about Kephart's nomenclature work, but he, um, he and George Massa did an incredible job of, of um, working with Paul Fink and um, Jim Thompson on the Tennessee side to, uh, to um, uh, untangle and, 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 and um, finalize names for areas for, you know, features in the Smokies. I mean, for example, there could be five big creeks on the North Carolina side and five big creeks on the Tennessee side. It, in order to um, accurately uh, name spaces, you had to disambiguate, you know, the, um, all the duplication that, that, um, that occurred. So they, they, they did an enormous job of, 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 of doing research to find what, what the names of various streams and hills and, and uh, 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 valleys might, if they had a, if they had a preexisting name, they would mark that on the on the map. But for those that didn't, they could name those things. And one of the things they did was name Charlie's Bunyan um, after Charlie Connor. I, I know that I read an article that has him in the um, ha, that has uh, a picture of him in the hospital, and he's saying he didn't have a bunion. So I'm not sure that he really had a bunion, but he did have some did have some sore feet on that trip. There, there is a nice picture in the book about uh, a birthday party yep. at, at uh, Charlie's house with everybody celebrating on the front porch. Right. But, uh, I have my own uh, story about Charlie's Bunyan. So uh -huh. there, there was a, a through hiker who um, was a postmaster in East Tennessee, Roby Hensley, and he started his through hike by parachuting to Springer Mountain, and <laughs> he got the trail name Jumpstart. And and in his uh, journal about hiking the Appalachian Trail, he said that the the fall off from Charlie's Bunyan is so steep that uh, if if you you fell off from Charlie's Bunyan, you'd need a sandwich to keep from starving to death before you hit bottom. <laughs> but, That's a good one. But but. That's just not true. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great uh, viewpoint in the Eastern uh, Smokies on on the the AT. Um, Maybe we could wrap up with some last thoughts from from the authors and from Libby, and and also your your favorite passages from uh, uh, Kephart's writings. Well, I'll, I'll take the lead on this if that's okay. Sure. Um, I think that one thing that my grandfather taught me um, when I was a young girl is that we stand on the shoulders of those who went before us. And that is true for whether we're, we're remembering family members or we're, whether we are um, brilliant biographers like George and Janet and everybody who's trying to preserve history, um, that we do stand on the shoulders of those we, that went before us. Um, and with that being said, Janet and George. George, do you want to um, read a passage? Oh, yeah, well, can you go ahead and do it? I'll, I'll find that. Can you read in the dark? <laughs> and and while you're hunting for a passage, uh, one last question came up. Um, th this was some uh, from some ringers who uh, live in North Carolina and hiked all through the Smokies, and they're they're asking, did Kephart spend time time hiking in other areas of the Southern Appalachians, other than the Smoky Mountain National Park, since the boundaries were obviously not established. You know, George, I, 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 um, I mean, I know he, he, he did trips with George Massa, um, and you know, Ma Massa had a car. So toward the, you know, toward the late, um, in the late twenties, early thirties, he did some, um, he did some exploring with. I mean, they went down to Georgia to, uh, um, but that that was really just that was still part of the southern appalachians i mean i know he did hiking earlier when he was in new york in the white mountains in the in the adirondacks when he was in st louis he he hiked um all over the uh you know all, all over the um 
wilderness areas around um, St. Louis, but um, I don't know, you know, other than, I mean, he was in, in Georgia at um, looking at the southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail. George, do you have an answer on that one? He might, he might not. So, so, so I, I, do, I do know from the book that, that Kephart hiked all over. He hiked in the White Mountains. He hiked in the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he traveled quite a bit. So um, I, I would assume in, in decades uh, around the Smokies that, that he hiked all over North Carolina and, and uh, eastern Tennessee. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, since he didn't drive, um, you know, it would have been where – you know, probably not wherever he could. He, he did, you know, in terms of his research for our Southern Highlanders, he did a lot of, of um, train travel at in other parts of the in other parts of the state, you know, because he was trying to or in, in other parts of the area um, because he was trying to uh, decide whether there was a, a you know, a, a Southern Highlander that he could um, that that was typical for the area. Um, and he was very used to walking when he lived on Hazel Creek. He would walk, what, 18 miles to the store to, you know, get any provision. So he was very used to walking. Well, Larry, I found my favorite passage, or that's one of my favorite passages. So I will, I will read it. Um, because I think in our pandemic times, um, I think this is a this is a piece Kephart wrote in 1931, right before he died. Actually, he wrote it before he died, obviously, but it was published after he died. But he's talking about the Appalachian Trail, so it's also, um, I think, appropriate since you're you're hosting this event today. But he says the pleasure of a walking trip is not in breaking records for endurance, but in the scenes and surprises of it, the fresh air and the exhilaration of lusty muscular movement the enjoyment of unspoiled natural surrounds, the peace of mind and relaxation from common everyday affairs. But all along that trail from Maine to Georgia, there is something new and interesting or even marvelous or even marvelous or quaint and lovable for anyone with an open mind and a free soul. Words, in, words of an enthusiast? <laughs> well, why shouldn't, why, well, why should not one be an enthusiast who at 68, is still climbing the highest hills of the trail country and sleeping out of nights just for the sheer enjoyment of it. Although 25 years ago, that same man could not have climbed Bunker Hill Monument without halting now and then to regain his breath. What the mountains and the forest did for me, they can do for other rundown folks. And then they too will be enthusiasts for one just can't be stolid or despondent when his lungs are full of mountain air and his blood is coursing free. Oh, great passage for the pandemic. Absolutely, yeah. Janet. And, and yeah, George, but, George, have you found a passage? Yeah, I did. Uh, when I went south into the mountains, I was seeking a back of beyond. This for more reasons than one. With a, a, an inborn taste, for the wild and romantic. I yearn for a strange land and a people that had the charm of originality. Again, I had a passion for early American history. And in far Appalachia, it seemed that I might realize the past and the present, seeing with my own eyes what life must have been to my pioneer ancestors of a century or two ago. Besides, I wanted to enjoy a pre-life in the open air. So casting about for such a place, I picked out the upper settlement uh, in Hazel Creek, far up under the lee of those smoky mountains that I had learned so little about. On the edge of this settlement, scant two miles from the post office, there was a copper mine, long disused on account of litigation and I got permission to occupy one of its abandoned cabins. 
Well, uh, bo both both wonderful passages, and uh, I guess the last observation from our audience: uh, the the museum librarian noticed the card catalog in the the background, uh, Janet, and she she really appreciates that, and yeah. and and I I think for for Janet, George, and and Libby, you've given our audience. Uh, a wonderful account of of Horace Kephart's life and and your work on the biography and uh, you know on on behalf of myself the Cornell uh, Club of Rockland and and Veronica at the the New City Library with thank you for a, a wonderful presentation. <laughs>